on this beautiful Sunday evening. The snow is definitely falling outside right now, at least here in Cresco. I'm not sure what weather conditions you're having, but if you are watching from the safety and warmth of your home, I trust that this will be an encouraging time for you. Right now, we're going to begin with a hymn that's out of the Majesty Hymn Book 466, a famous hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. If you'd like to look the lyrics up online, feel free to do so. Let's sing together all three stanzas, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Through your son, Jesus Christ, thank you for what we have in salvation. Even as we were seeing this morning in Sunday school, I pray that we would not neglect so great salvation as it states in Hebrews 2, 3. I pray that we would live out a life of consecration, that our mouth would sing your praises in adoration, and that, Lord, we would be able to truly worship you in a spirit that is truth and holiness. Father, I thank you for this time. I know that for so many folks, they are battling sickness, and uh, they are just kind of struggling at the start of this new year, and we pray that you would give them healing, allow them to again uh, feel that uh, normal physical uh, presence that they've grown to know and love, and we just ask that right now, those that are struggling with doubts, those that are struggling with discouragement, um, you would just help them. We know that for many, it's as much a mind battle as it is a physical battle. So allow their minds to be stayed upon you, uh, Lord, through your spirit and according to your word. We pray that you might bring truths to their memory, to the forefront of their mind, and allow them just to keep things in perspective that are eternal, that are right, and that are good. Um, Father, we ask for those that may be traveling, you give safety on the roads. And whether it be coming to church or whether it be those that are uh, just traveling and, and uh, heading on through the area, we just ask, Lord, for your hand of protection upon them. Thank you again for this time that we have. We do pray that it would be a point of growth in our life spiritually. Uh, we pray that as a result of meeting together, even if from a distance, um, that we would be edified and encouraged and challenged in our faith. Lord, we love you. It's in Christ's name we ask. Amen. All right, you can turn to the next hymn. It's going to be 382, Nearer, Still Nearer. 
And uh, I'll give a few announcements here, but let me just allow the accompaniment to turn. 382 nearer, still nearer. Uh, as far as announcements, very brief, but the things that I shared this morning, we will have brochures available for the Sweethearts Getaway. Uh, as far as the latest that I have from Brother Jenkins at the camp, um, this is still planned February 5th and 6th, and uh, the speaker is Brother Morris Gleiser. So please um, plan on joining if you are able to do so. Um, and I'll let you know if anything changes from the side of the camp towards us. But right now, this is our, our plan, our, our intent moving forward. Also, we have the uh, Tri-State Bible Camp winter weekends um, for the uh, fourth through eighth grade. I'll, let me give the seventh through twelfth because theirs is actually first. So January 15th and 16th is seventh through twelfth. And that's Brother Adrian Burden who will be preaching. Um, the second weekend, the following weekend, January the 22nd through the 23rd, um, that will be grades 4 through 8, and that's Josh John. Uh, we had heard him preach last year uh, for the very same retreat with the young people. Um, if things would change, if a specific division is canceled, or if they say we're going to go from two days to just the one day on Saturday, I'll keep you posted. But right now, um, I just wanted to let you know we have the information. And uh, you can pick that up next time you come to church. Also, you can sign up for the uh, church cleaning list February through November. Um, I know that there's a couple that have already been claimed in there. But if you come and look at the list, uh, consider helping us out in that area. And then also with the snow shoveling schedule, um, I am on for today and Wednesday. But if you would like to take it from the following uh, sign up that would be next Sunday and then the Wednesday that follows so it's always going to be the Sunday and Wednesday paired together but if you'd like to put your name down and help us out um, that'd be fantastic I mentioned birthdays this morning and anniversaries so happy birthday and anniversary if I missed you uh, let me know you can text me my phone is on silence and I'll try to make sure I add you to the list right now we're going to sing 382 nearer still nearer <laughs> Ever to 
He keeps me singing. give as far as the tithes or the offerings. You can mail it to the church. Um, although right now I have to smile because our mailbox was taken out by the plow. That would be the third time. So I will be putting in a new mailbox, but uh, I encourage you just come to service and you can put it in the box that's located in the lobby on the table. And then for those that would need to mail it in, um, I will make sure we get a new box in the ground soon. And uh, you can also use the church website in www.pdbc.us and on there you're going to find the link to Tithely and you could give through the website. So I encourage you to use any of those resources as a means of giving the tithe and the offering. At this time I'm going to ask my family, uh, at least some of them, to join me. <clears throat> and we're going to sing uh, a song titled I Am With You. Well, the 
I surround you. I surround the waters deep. Fear not, loved one, in my presence. You will never be alone. Trust me, loved one, you are precious. You are mine, my very own. Sunday school and the Sunday morning message, this would be it. I've titled it A Heart of Doubt or A Heart of Unbelief. And uh, in the Sunday school time, if you've missed it, we were looking at the life of Samson, at least a part of his life in Judges 15 and 16, and seeing that instead of it being a point of ignorance as to why he ended up where he was at, it really was a point of knowing and refusing to do. He knew what he had given as a vow, and he chose willingly to not hold up that vow. He lived in the land of compromise. And as we enter 2021, and here we are on the third day of the year, I trust that this year won't be a year of compromise for us, but a year of consecration. The second part was the morning message out of John 9. And in John 9, you see two groups of individuals. Well, really, you have the individual, the formerly blind man, and then you have the group of the religious leadership. But on the one end, you have him showing the acceptance, a heart of belief in two words. He says, I believe. And then you have the religious leadership that should ultimately know so much more than this formerly blind beggar would have known on a theological plane. And yet they're the ones that have a heart of unbelief. He has sight spiritually. They are blind spiritually. And at the end of chapter 9, you see really the, the, the set up for the discourse of Jesus Christ as the good shepherd. They, having failed to lead the Jewish people to God, pointing them in the direction of the Messiah who was coming, who was foretold, who was here in their midst, they failed. Christ would not fail. He would lead as they needed him to lead. A heart of doubt or a heart of unbelief. The hymn writer and pastor Robert Robinson summed it up in the 1757 hymn, which is titled Come Thou Fount. He was 22 years old at the time. In the third stanza, it says this, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. 
prone to leave the God I love. Now, in all of the music tonight, I have tried to weave through this that theme of not doubting, of not giving in, whether because of circumstance and trial or whether just because of our humanity and our flesh. One of the first ones that we sang, 466, on the first stanza of Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, it says, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, God of glory, Lord of love, hearts unfold like flowers before the opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. In the hymn 477, it was He Keeps Me Singing, and many of you know that the words and music were penned and put together by Luther Bridgers, whose family had perished in a tragic fire in the course of the evening. This was the song that then he penned after losing his family in a tragedy of the fire. There's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low, fear not, I am with thee, peace be still, in all of life's ebb and flow. To call his family's death a ebb and flow of life seems quite the understatement. He then focuses on the strings of the heart, the, the, the chords that would have been played, but they were damaged because of sin. And then when the Lord comes in and intervenes, being able to have those sing once again. To be able to sing, to be able to go through difficulties and trials, and, and maybe it's a, a physical trial that you face this evening, maybe it's financial, maybe it's interpersonal, Maybe it's just emotional, intellectual, whatever it might be, the Lord knows of your trial. He knew in John 9, verse 34, that the man had been excommunicated and thrown out of the synagogue. And when the Lord heard of it, he sought after that man. The cares of that man, how he would fend for himself for what he would do at that point. Yes, having physical sight, but being excommunicated by the Pharisees and the religious leadership. The Lord knew that and he interceded. He met him. He came to him. He spoke to him. And through that, the man then came not only having physical sight, but spiritual sight as well. In Luke 7, verses 18 through 35, you've got this cluster of 18 verses. And really, it defines perfectly, and you'll see it's in harmony with John 9, and really from the life of the way Samson exhibited his selfishness, his pride, his unbelief, his willful choosing to move away from the Lord, it gives us admonition to not follow in Samson's footsteps, to follow in the footsteps of the formerly blind man who then has his sight, and in his simplicity of faith and trusting Christ, the Messiah, he finds spiritual sight and he finds a light marked by peace and rest. Luke 7, verses 18 through 35, I'll read it in its entirety. You'll remember that this, as far as the John, this is John the Baptist that's being addressed. And the disciples of John showed him of all these things. And John calling unto him, two of his disciples sent them to Jesus saying, Art thou he that should come? Now remember in John chapter 9, the formerly blind man, he desired to worship God. He had stated that in verse 31. And then a little bit later, he is speaking to Christ as the Messiah. And he had to be informed and, and, and shown who it was that was in front of him. And he believed and he worshiped Christ. So Here's the very same question really coming about. The disciples sent them to Jesus saying, Art thou he that should come? Or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John the Baptist hath sent us unto thee saying, Art thou he that should come? Or look we for another? And in that same hour, Christ, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits. And unto many that were blind, he gave sight. And then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way. And tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye out in the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. 
This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God. Means they glorified God, being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected, notice the willful action. Notice the choosing. The lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. And the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation? And to what are they like? They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you, and ye have not wept. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say, He hath a devil. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of all her children. Let's open in prayer. Father, I pray that this evening, as we see really from two different perspectives, from Samson, who according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, knew you. He had a faith. He understood where his power came from. And yet in living with compromise and giving in through compromise, he basically gave up the values, the position of victory that he should have fought from. Ultimately, his vision, not having spiritual vision, allowing him to then fall headlong into the trap of Satan. We also then see one who didn't have his eyesight and then was given his eyesight. Miraculously, in simple faith, coming to understand who you were as you stood before him, never having seen you, but having heard your voice, and then believing and worshiping you. Father, we see in this passage tonight in Luke 7, the very same process. John the Baptist, at a point in prison, having stood for what was right, having stood for true values from a position of victory, and yet, even though he has his vision, and he is spiritually seeing, there is this point of doubt. Lord, it might be that tonight there are those who are believers. And doubt doesn't mean that they have lost their salvation. Doubt might be that you are perfecting them in their salvation. They are working out their salvation with fear and with trembling. There are points of trial and conflict and tragedy and sorrow and sadness and maybe a start to a new year that for many is, is different than what they would have anticipated. And in this, Lord, I pray that even if at times there are the hearts of doubt, I pray that it wouldn't be a heart of unbelief. For those who are watching that may not know you as Savior, may they relinquish and give up the heart of unbelief that willful choosing to remain in darkness. Father, I pray that they would be surrendered to you and come to know you as the Savior. Thank you for this time. It's in Christ's name I ask. Amen. Let me give you quickly some background here. John the Baptist, as I said, he was in prison. Uh, he was in prison because Herod Antipas, who was the leader at the time, had taken his sister-in-law, his brother Philip's wife, as his own. And John the Baptist had spoke out against this, Luke chapter 3, 19 through 20. It's Matthew 4, 12 that says this. Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. Matthew 14, 1 through 5, again, tells us that it was Herod the Tetrarch, Herod Antipas, who was in charge at this time. Uh, this is John the Baptist. It says, verse 2, he's risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, it is not lawful for thee to have her. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. Now it's in Luke 7, 16. If you look back just a few verses, Christ is recognized as a great prophet. A great prophet is risen up among us. In this section of the chapter, Christ is revealed as the prophet, the Messiah. Just like in John chapter 8, he revealed himself for who he was. The Greek wording, ego, eimi, I am. It's the Jehovistic I am of Exodus 3.14. Even though that might be new to some who are watching tonight, it wasn't new to the Pharisees. 
They knew what he was claiming. They knew what he was saying. They knew that he was making himself equal with God. Philippians 2 tells us that he didn't think it robbery to be equal with God. It wasn't covetous for him because he was, in fact, God in the flesh. The blind beggar gets his sight, believes he worships. The Jewish leadership, they refuse, they reject, just like in this chapter of Luke 7. Christ, first of all, he gave them a choice. The disciples of John come with the question, are you the Messiah or do we look for another? Now, it might be that you say that seems, you know, for somebody who's in prison because of his faith and standing for that which was right, that seems to be the issue of doubt. And as I was wrestling with this, in my own mind, maybe you in your own heart have wrestled with the area of doubt. And you felt that as a believer, if you ever have doubt, then that is wrong or that you are really just um, not in a position of righteousness or you have lost your salvation. You can't lose your salvation. Think of it this way. Doubt doesn't understand what God is doing or why he is doing it. And it creates turmoil within our spirit because we resist having to walk by faith. That's what doubt is. Doubt is that internal compass of flesh that says to walk forward apart from knowing the how or the why that this is unwise. That you need the empirical evidence. You need, you need the science behind it. You need your logic. You need your reasoning. There needs to be more Proof to show you before then you would step out. But Hebrews 11 once is just the opposite. Hebrews 11 once says faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The faith walk is not the walk of sight. It's the walk of sanctification. It's the sanctified walk. It's, it's walking according to the precepts that God has given you. And when he's telling you this is the way that you should walk in, walk ye in it. Don't depart to the left or to the right. Walk on in this path. Right now, we are bound so much by our flesh, so much by our humanity, that when doubt comes in, even as believers, we question, well, if I was truly saved, I wouldn't have doubts. I disagree. The fundamental difference between doubt and unbelief is the matter of the will. It's said that doubt is a matter of the mind, whereas unbelief is a matter of of the will. The, the beggar wanted to understand who the Messiah was. He had already made it plain to the Pharisees as he was giving his own discourse that those who are sinners, not right with God, wouldn't be heard by God. He desired to be heard by God and to worship God. And then the question is asked him, do you believe in the Son of God? Are you, are you a follower of the Son of God? And, and he was saying, in essence, to paraphrase, yes, I, I want to, I want this, but I need to be shown. I need to know who he is. And the Lord said to him again, by paraphrase, that I am he. And then he believed and he worshiped. It was a matter of the will that he relinquished. He submitted. He gave in. And I highlighted his faith some weeks back. And for all of those, there was the deaf man. There were the two blind men. And Christ uses the medium of spit. Why would he do that? Because it's the furthest thing from logic. It's the furthest thing from human reasoning. If the Lord is going to see if this is an action based off of faith or the flesh, well, you clearly chose the right medium to bring about the response because no normal, rational thinking, sane individual would allow a person to spit on their fingers and then put it in the other person's mouth. They wouldn't allow it. They wouldn't allow it to be that you put your fingers in my ears and, and touch my tongue after you've spit on your own fingers or to spit on the ground and make mud or to spit in his eyes, it says in the Mark 8 account. In all of this, you have a decision that is being made by the individual, the beggar and the Pharisee. And that decision of the Pharisee was, I will not allow myself to cross that line, to go beyond my own level of comfort in human reasoning and logic. 
The Christian walk might be a lot easier if we were mindless robots supernaturally forced to believe and follow Christ, but this isn't the case. The very fact that we go through periods of doubt illustrates all the more the gift the Lord has given us in his Holy Spirit, John 14, 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. John 14, 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send you in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. If you're looking to me for your confidence spiritually, you are looking to the wrong individual. If you look to the church to find your basis of hope and stability, you're looking to the wrong source. It's when we look through the word of God, by the spirit of God, to the God who has saved our souls, that then he reveals to us, as only he can, because he's the comforter, how we should walk. And many times when the Lord confirms in your heart what it is that you should do and how you should live, there might be those around you that are the skeptics and not understanding, yet you need to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. We're not alone in this trial of doubt. John was used to the wilderness, and now he sits in prison. He'd been there for some time. John knew the Messiah was come to set prisoners free, yet he was in prison. The very words Christ spoke in the synagogue in Luke 4.18 may have come into his thinking. Christ had said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He was quoting, obviously, from the Old Testament. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. Notice, to preach deliverance to the captives. As he's quoting Isaiah 61.1, would it have been that John the Baptist, privy to that knowledge and understanding, that I am now captive? I'm in a prison. It seems that this was the very thing he came to do to release me from a point of bondage, and yet now I'm in the midst of bondage. John had preached the Messiah bringing judgment, baptizing with the Spirit, and separating the wheat from the chaff, but Christ was bringing blessing upon those that he met. The leadership amongst the Jews had done nothing to assist John, and the physical and emotional strain mounted daily. Others have faced the trial of doubt. It's not limited to John the Baptist in prison prior to his execution. You have Moses in Numbers 11, Elijah in 1 Kings 19, Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 7 through 9 and 14 through 18. You have Paul in 2 Corinthians 1 and 8 through 9, when he said, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure. Notice his adjectives and his descriptive phrases. Above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. You see then that dichotomy. You see the spirit and the flesh. You see that in the midst of belief, there's doubt. I believe, help thou mine unbelief. You see him in his bonds, 2 Corinthians, as he's writing to the church at Corinth, and he says, this is in me. I know this is a part of me, but it will not define me because ultimately I'm not going to trust myself. I'm going to trust God, which raiseth the dead. It's Abraham taking Isaac as a sacrifice. Hebrews gives us the other side of the story, believing that even if it was necessary for God to raise his son from the dead, he was committed to obeying. It was a choice. He wasn't forced to commit that with Isaac. He wasn't forced to say, come on, Isaac, let's get out of bed. Let's rise up early before it's day. Let's, let's get the, uh, the sticks. Let's take the, the source of the fire. And we're going to have a sacrifice on an altar. And as Isaac is processing all of this, that wasn't forced upon Abraham. And it also wasn't forced upon Isaac. We see Isaac's unrelenting faith in his father, his trust in Abraham, his demonstration that knowing with this, he wasn't being forced to go along. Romans 12, 1 tells us that as the living sacrifices, we are to glorify God in our lives. We can't glorify God in our lives if we refuse willingly to walk by faith. If all we ever know is flesh, then we're no different than the Pharisees. I know that people today, it's 2021, so uh, anyone who has standards 
biblical standards, they're called um, legalists. That's not the definition of legalism. But legalists were individuals that felt their good works were going to get them to heaven. The Pharisees did believe that, so by definition, they were legalists. A legalist is not saved. A legalist, by definition, is somebody who believes that his or her good works will get them to heaven. Not Christ, not the blood of Christ, not the sacrifice on Calvary, but who they are, their works. That is defined in Luke 7 and in John 9 by the religious leadership. The second area, though, Christ gave a choice, but he also he gave credentials. Notice in verse 21 through 23, he sends them back, but only after, verse 21, and in the same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way, and tell John what things ye have seen and heard. How that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor the gospel is preached. You realize that's fulfillment of what he was saying back in Luke 4 from Isaiah 61.1. He is showing by his credentials, by the works. He does this by a number of ways. First of all, through the power. Through the power of the miracles, he cured the infirmities, the plagues, and the evil spirits. He gives sight to the blind. Through his miracles, he demonstrated his power as the Messiah to overrule the laws of nature, of death, and of evil spirits. Secondly, he does it through the fulfillment of prophecy. The prophets had clearly stated that the Messiah would do these miracles. Isaiah 29, Isaiah 35, Isaiah 42, Isaiah 61, Psalm 72, 2, Psalm 146, 8, Zechariah 11, 11. All of these prophecies speaking of the coming Messiah. I found this interesting, and somebody spent an exorbitant amount of time crunching the numbers on this one. Uh, but the mathematical odds that Christ could fulfill all the scriptural prophecies relating to the Messiah and not be the Messiah are incomprehensible. Specifically, this is what they have given. Uh, it's 1 times 10 to the 28th. First, we answer the question, what is 10 to the positive 28th power called? The powers of a thousand are given illion names, million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, etc. These are 1,000 to the second, third, fourth, fifth, etc. power. Thus, 10 to the 28th is 10 to the first times 10 to the 27th. The latter of which is 1,000 to the ninth. One less than nine is eight, so 10 is to the 27th. It's octillion. Thus, 10 to the 28th is 10 octillion. Now, you'd think I'm smart if I did that on my own. I have no idea what I just read. But the odds that Christ could fulfill all of the messianic prophecies and not be the Messiah, well, actually, it's impossible because he is the Messiah. There were those that, as the religious leadership, they just needed more. Just need more proof. Yes, okay, statistically, uh, 10 to the 28th is 10 octillion. But that's not good enough. The odds, yes, you seem to have some evidence. There seems to be a case here, but I'm not going to hear it. We've heard this in recent days, and the odds are far less than what is established here. Christ is the Messiah. And in simple faith, by really not an act of the will, but in a acceptance, receiving, rather than a refusal by the will, this blind beggar, formerly blind, now comes to the point of conversion. This next area that the Lord demonstrated his credentials through his preaching, his preaching spoke of a heavenly kingdom, not a political one. It spoke of those who were poor in spirit, not just poor monetarily. It spoke of spiritual peace and freedom, not just from the Roman oppression. He stressed the personal ministry as the Messiah, not the political one. His preaching was not merely the words of a man. He came with a supernatural authority that was recognized by all who heard him. Remember Matthew 7, 29, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. But fourthly, through his promises, Christ promised the blessings of the Messiah. He also promised the judgment of the Messiah. Which is why I found it interesting that there were commentaries saying that John 9 seemed to be contradictory with John 3. 
The Christ came to seek and to save them which are lost. And yet in not even reading the end of John 3, 19 through 21, God came to seek and to save that with the Son of Man being lifted up, he would draw all men to himself. But those who will not receive, those who choose to not believe, those who say there's got to be better statistics, there's got to be more signs, there's got to be more proof. Uh, if he were the Messiah, he would do something bigger and greater than this. They are the ones that are missing out, not because it's been forced upon them, not because of a supernatural decree that they would then reject their own opportunity for salvation. But as the word of God had told us, as I read it in Luke 7, against themselves, they refuse to believe against themselves their own opportunity for salvation. Literally, they sabotaged their own opportunity. Instead of blessing, they brought about God's hand of judgment. Warren Wiersbe had said this in his commentary. There are many people today who criticize the church for not changing the world and solving the economic, political, and societal problems. What they forget is that God changes his world by changing individual people. History shows that the church has often led the way in humanitarian service and reform, but the church's main job is to bring the lost sinners to the Savior. Everything else is a byproduct of that. Proclaiming the gospel must always be the church's first priority. Speaking with somebody after the service this morning, it isn't just about clothing those in need of clothing or giving food to the hungry. To have a, a food pantry, a clothing ministry in a church, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, maybe to use the downstairs of a building in your church or your church property as a hub for voters to come and vote, wonderful. And yet, that's not the primary function. The primary function is that of preaching the gospel, giving the good news that there is a Savior and his name is Jesus Christ. Thirdly, Christ gave a choice. He gave credentials. He also gave compliments. Speaking of John, this is, this is uh, interesting. In, in Luke 7, verses 24 through 29, uh, he speaks of the prophet John from a couple of different perspectives. First of all, personally as a prophet. Christ used three questions as the basis of showing more of who John the Baptist really was. He says, what well, went ye out into the wilderness for to see a reed shaken with the wind? John was not a compromiser. Samson was a compromiser. Samson could have been viewed from afar by friends and Philistines and the ladies as one that when it served his purposes, then he would take a stand. He would use his strength in a way that it was best suiting him. But he was a compromiser. This first area, do you expect to see a reed that's, that's blowing in the wind? He wasn't a compromiser. The second question, what well, went he out for to see a man clothed in soft raiment? Those who are inclined and desirous of the lives of luxury are usually most opposed to the hardships found in ministry and the faith life. It's why the health and wealth gospel, as people speak of it, is so against scriptural teaching. To believe that as you live righteously, then God is somehow indebted to give you all of these things, and by all of these things, we specifically mean monetarily. I understand that God can give monetarily, and he chooses to lift some up and to give them, and they have to be stewards with what God gives them. But to believe that somehow the life of luxury is also the life of righteousness goes against John the Baptist's testimony as he sat in prison waiting to be executed because he had stood up for what was right. There's the area of it being um, the third question. What went he out for to see a prophet? John was the last of the Old Testament prophets, but much more than this. It wasn't just on a personal level. It was the practical level as a prophet. He was of the Old Testament dispensation, according to Malachi 3.1, Malachi 4, 5 through 6, and then Matthew 17, 10 through 13. He was different than the other prophets because he was the subject of prophecy as well as the messenger of it. He was the forerunner for the Messiah. He was the herald who brought the message to the world that the Lord had come. Not just personally or practically as a prophet, but thirdly, positionally as a prophet. John would not see outside the cell of his jail. 
At the point of his beheading, they came to him in prison and did the deed there. As far as prophets are concerned, Christ said John the Baptist was the greatest, yet positionally in the kingdom of God, the least amongst the kingdom of God, under the dispensation of grace, is more understanding and has more understanding than what John had. Matthew 14, 6 through 14 gives the account of the beheading of John the Baptist. Christ speaks to the people. Conversion of heart follows conversion of the ears. It's why I said that of Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, of the blind beggar in John 9, there was a process, if you will, of conversion. And it may have been that it started to begin with conversion of the ears in what they were hearing, in what they were processing and understanding their position before a holy God, and it led them then to a conversion of heart. Just because a person is in attendance does not mean that they are at attention. There have been many studies carried out with the sole intention of learning how to gain an audience and keep their attention. Books have been written, business models have been developed, seminars have been held, and yet the age-old problem of keeping people engaged in what is being said is still as relevant today as it was in 31 A.D. It isn't just that they had ears, but do they have ears to hear? It isn't just do you have eyes, but do you have eyes to see? Are you willing to go beyond the pale of the things in this life, the temporal in which we live, what we can touch, what we taste, what we see in this life, and look beyond, like Abraham, searching, looking for a city not built with human hands, it was the faith life. It was the faith walk. They justified God. I had shared with you, as we all know, justification means to declare righteous. The people were not making God righteous. They were declaring him to be righteous. And they agreed with him about their own condition. Remember in John 9, I had shared with you the third point. That if we refuse or reject the unconventional hand of the master, we remain short of confession. Apart from confession, there is no conversion. If I simply acknowledge in heart that I'm a sinner, but I don't actually confess to the Lord that I am a sinner, then I'm not saved. It's when a person does more than simply acknowledge with the crowd of people that we all have our problems. Nobody's perfect. All of that is self-justification, but it's not conversion and it's not savior justification. It's impossible to be saved unless you're willing to acknowledge your own sinful condition and agree with God regarding your need for salvation through Christ. The beauty of salvation is that even though I am an unrighteous, vile, sinful, worthless, undeserving person, I am pronounced righteous by God as I have the righteousness of Christ imputed onto my account. His blood has cleansed me and allowed me by his grace to stand clean before Christ. It's contrasted by the religious leadership who justified themselves rather than God. They declared themselves to be righteous and thus rejected the true righteousness that's found only through Jesus Christ. Christ gave a choice. He gave his credentials. He gave compliments to John the Baptist, but fourthly, as we conclude verses 30 through 35, Christ gave condemnation. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves. That was their choice. They weren't forced to make that choice. There might be those that would say, well, before the foundations of the world, that was predetermined. That's not what scripture says. And that's not taught on the Bible. They rejected the counsel of God against themselves. They chose to remain in the darkness. They chose to hold on to the trinkets of the treasures found in this temporal existence rather than relinquish those at the hand of Almighty God, admit by confession their condition as sinners and plead to be saved. And it can be as simple as the two words of the formerly blind man of John 9, I believe. He acknowledged and he worshiped Christ as God. We see Christ giving the condemnation. The critic's appetite is never satisfied. Often it's the Christian critic who has the spiritual tapeworm of bitterness, preventing them from receiving proper nutrition, and they will slowly starve as Christians. 
The Pharisees and lawyers had justified themselves rather than God. They rejected his counsel against themselves willingly. They rejected John on the basis of what he didn't do, and they rejected Christ on the basis of what he did do. Both John and Jesus were falsely accused of being something they were not. Both were accused of doing the works of Satan. John's message of judgment was misapplied as asceticism. Christ's message of salvation through grace was misapplied as carnality. The Pharisees and lawyers desired neither the wedding nor the funeral. Much like a fickle child who rejects both choices on the dinner plate, they too would walk away spiritually hungry and they would walk away spiritually blind. It wasn't that these individuals didn't know what to do. It was that they knew what to do, but wouldn't do it. This becomes the defining point then between doubt and unbelief. It's the will. Proverbs 29, 1. He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. 2 Corinthians 6, 2, for he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Let me conclude by simply giving this. Courage spiritually is not found in the absence of doubt. But when in the midst of doubt, we respond through a heart of obedience. When we don't understand why God is doing what he is doing, we're prone to doubt. When we understand what God is asking and we refuse, we're demonstrating unbelief. Maybe tonight you're struggling with doubt. Maybe through sickness, through financial mishap. Maybe it's through the change of job, career, relationships within family and friends, neighbors, having to move, whatever the case might be. Maybe right now you're struggling with the area of doubt. Remember, it doesn't mean that for a believer who's living for the Lord, they never experience seasons of doubt. The blind beggar may have had points of doubt. He didn't allow bitterness to reign in his life, though. And when confronted with the truth, he had a heart of obedience. Here we have John the Baptist. He's in prison. He's been doing the work of the Lord as the messenger for the Messiah. And he simply asks, some would say maybe as a, a point of doubt, are you the one? Or is there another? Is there another that we should be looking for? And the Lord gives the choice, but he also showed by his credentials who he was. And at that point, we see that then there's the compliments paid to John the Baptist because of his willingness to stand, who he was as a prophet. The Lord knew him far better than we know, even from the narrative of Scripture. But then the condemnation was given. The condemnation was not given to John the Baptist because he had doubts. The condemnation was given to those who, when understanding and when the truth was revealed, simply chose to do nothing with it. And by choosing to do nothing with it, they were rejecting the truth. Now, I realize that there are those that would say this, this seems similar to what we see in the realm of politics. People that know what is right, but choose not to do it. And ultimately, I don't know their heart in the matter. It does seem that many, rather than their desire to serve the people, those who elected them to those positions, it seems that maybe they're more concerned with their own positions and power. That the love of money has swayed them in a direction that they are willing to advocate and give up on what they know to be true. Somebody recently had said regarding a politician, ah, it's just, it's, it's maddening, sad. Maddening when they seem to be one way and then when given opportunity to stand for what would be right and true and constitutional, they they abdicate, they give it up, they they punt, they have somebody else, and then there are those that have come full circle and what they full well know to be true in what they are called to do and their ministry of service, they have come to the conclusion that that then it's not them that's in need of change, it's, it's everybody else. The Pharisees never looked inwardly. The religious leadership never saw themselves as the ones to get the condemnation from God. Quite the contrary. They saw themselves in the position of doling out the condemnation. 
of casting out people like Jesus Christ or this formerly blind beggar from the temple. The marvelous work of his freedom of sight, they didn't want to discuss that. They didn't want to talk about the facts. Don't let facts clutter the discussion. And they kicked him out. And as he was then excommunicated from the synagogue, it was Christ who sought him out. And that man's physical sight then turned into spiritual sight. I pray that tonight you won't allow discouragement to settle in your heart because of a pursuit of the how or the why. My encouragement to you is simply go back to the who of Scripture, Jesus Christ. Focus on him, and then even if you don't have the answers and you don't find resolve in these issues, when you know that the Lord is leading, have a heart of obedience. And simply follow him and allow him to do the work through you so that ultimately the Lord can use you to help change those that may be around you. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. I pray that 2021 would be a year that's marked by a heart of belief, not unbelief. A heart that's marked by confidence in Christ, not marked by doubt. Lord, there will be times of doubt. There will be points of struggle. And I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that there are some tonight as they are sick and, and maybe away from family and friends and folks that are watching from, from out of state that maybe aren't even a part of this church. I don't pretend to know all of the things that are weighing on their minds and hearts, but I know that for some, maybe there's some very severe doubts. And Lord, I just pray that as you show yourself strong to them, that they would depend upon you, that they would trust you all the more, and even if they never get the answers to the how or the whys of life, they'd focus on who, and that is Jesus Christ. Lord, I love you. Thank you for this time. It's in Christ's name we ask. Amen.